Um, hi everyone, welcome to Paddock 23. For those of you who um, are repeat offenders at some of these um, field days. Um, look, today, um, well, George sort of stole my thunder a bit because I was actually going to thank Mark and Pete. Um, they're certainly responsible for everything with um, everything you see down here. They certainly maintain and look after all our experiments and um, have been pretty busy preparate, um, preparing the site um, for you all to come down and look at today. Now, um, so today what I want to talk about is, um, is some work or a project where we're working on looking at um, mixed fodder crops. So comparing single um, and mixed species. So I guess um, fodder crops are a pretty important component of our feed base. Um, they're they're um, invaluable for their high quality, their ability to fill our winter feed gap. I guess traditionally oats has probably been what we've been using. I guess more recently we've um, there's been or well, there's been a swing towards or inclusion of um, so dual purpose crops and brassicas as um, as a forage. And I guess more recently, um, there's been, um, due to animal health issues and um, um, associated with um, mineral imbalances and a few other things like that, I guess there's been consideration that, considering the quality of some of these, um, these fodder crops that we've been playing with, we're not actually achieving the animal production that we, that we should be for their quality. So I guess that's where this, um, this interest in or one of the reasons for this interest in mixed fodder crops has come from. Now there's been um, quite a bit of um, anecdotal evidence, I suppose, about longer growing seasons, higher dry matter production, improved lightweight gain. And I guess that's basically the focus um, or the reason that we're actually been doing this work. So this work is um, it's being conducted in three locations, um, up at Glen Innes, uh, here at Tamworth, and also down in Wagga. So we've got a range of different environments that we're we're trying to um, have a look at this over to be able to give some, some better information um, to, to producers and advisors um, so that um, we get a better understanding about what, what the potential of these different, um, different species are or these, these different fodder crops. Now, as part of this, um, this project, I've spoken, or the team and I have spoken to quite a few producers and advisors just to try and get an understanding about why people are growing fodder crops. And um, it's extremely varied. So it goes from those that are after just a quick, a quick uh, low input uh, quality winter feed gap filler, through to those that really want to push the system, maximise animal production and are prepared to feed it with good fertility in order to achieve that. So what goes in that mix is, is extremely varied as well. Some have, um, some like to include brassicas, some like ryegrass, some refuse to have ryegrass, especially if it's in a, in a cropping system, in a rotation. Um, legumes, the role of legumes in a mix is also quite varied. Some people like to include it or recommend it because it's, it's high quality. Some like to include it because there's an opportunity later in the growing season in order to be able to um, fix some nitrogen from that, so then you've actually got that nitrogen fixation as a carryover then for the subsequent crops. Then you've got others that actually really like to have the legume there because it's actually, if it sets seed or when it sets seed, it's actually putting, starting to build a seed bank, which is then used um, for the pasture that they're planting in the future. So there's a really broad range of reasons why people are choosing the species and the way they manage them. So today what I want to talk about was, um, so the Tamworth team, um, we're working on agronomy, which is what you've got here behind me. And we've also got, um, we're also doing some on-farm validation. So here we've got nice white pegs. Um, we don't graze this with animals. We, um, we just use a harvester to remove the bulk. But we actually go out on producer properties. We get to see what producers are doing, why they're doing it, um, the mixes they're using, why they're using it and also get to monitor the animal production um, they're getting off those systems. So um, with the on-farm validation, we've actually got, in each of those cases, we've got a, um, a single species. So, in, um, so we had two sites this year that the Tamworth team were monitoring. Um, one, uh, one was at Bogabri and one was at Manila. One of those, uh, both of them had as their single species as oats, um, but the mix they had was quite varied. And again, it came down to what they were hoping to achieve. And, and also their weeds. 
So um, we can discuss that a little bit later um, um, if there's any questions associated that, with that. But what I really wanted to focus on today was um, basically some of the findings from our, um, from our agronomy. Now, um, there's certainly been a big focus today with um, Lou and Sean um, and with what everyone's been saying about, um, and it's certainly no surprise looking around you, um, that this year is certainly very, very different to the two years prior to. So we've been, this is our third year of these agronomy trials. Um, so we started in 2021, 21, 22 were, were awesome years. Great for, uh, for testing out some of these different, um, different mixes. And then this year is certainly our contrasting contrasting year. So in the handout that I've given you, um, there's what, we've, what I've tried to do is pull together um, the data from 2021 and compare it with what we're actually been seeing this year. So you can actually see, see the effect um, of, um, of this dry on some of the productivity. Um, we're planning on doing um, an, our fifth assessment um, tomorrow. Um, and then it'll be interesting to see whether we actually get anything, any regrowth from that. Um, we don't have a lot of soil moisture. Um, Sean was talking about that. We don't have a lot, le lot left in our bucket. It's pretty dry. So I don't know that we're going to get an awful lot of production going forward. But, um, but in the first, the two years prior to that, um, we actually got seven harvests. So we were, you know, we had growth or our final assessment was in November, which was pretty remarkable. So we actually got to see the benefit in, this lo in these longer growing seasons. Um, with these, um, with some of these different mixes. All right, so um, if we just start with our standard. So, so what, we've, what we've actually done in our experiment, so we had, um, we've got six core treatments, I suppose, um, six treatments which we've repeated each year. And then this year we've got a, a range of other different, a number of other different uh, treatments where we're just, um, yeah, just tweaking a few different things to, um, to have a look to see, see their effect. So, um, so let's start with oats. So in this case, we've got Drover oats, is the oats that we've been using um, each year. It, um, so starting with 2021, um, had great, great production. Um, one of its characteristics is that it does have um, good production early and that, that was reflected in our numbers. Um, it peaked in September um, and then declined pretty rapidly after that because it had um, it had you know gone reproductive and it didn't regrow after didn't regrow well after that after the September assessment or October assessment. So when we looking at it um, this year, now I'll go back a step. So that um, so yeah so looking at this year, um, we had an excellent start again. So when you have a look at our rainfall, like we had incredible rainfall in March this year and also back in 2021, which we're comparing it to. So it means that we actually had a good start, a similar start to the season. And um, both experiments were also sowed on stored soil moisture. But because we haven't had that follow-up rainfall, so we've, um, we've had about, um, I think I worked out about 100, a bit over 100 mils um, from April through to August on this site, which is, and our monthly rainfall has been average to below average um, every month compared to 2021, where it was average to above average every month. So, you know, it, it certainly has, uh, yeah, the bucket just has not been able to keep up with the growth, our bucket full of um, soil water. So um, this year we had really, really good start to the season, good productivity, good, up, good productivity, but it certainly has not done anything like it has, um, has it, like it has done previously. So having that stored soil moisture to start with, start your season with, is, um, is invaluable to be able to kickstart the productivity of, of that fodder crop. When you add, add ryegrass to that mix, so you have an oats ryegrass mix, what we actually found was that um, the oats and the rye actually did compete with one another. So your productivity of your oats sort of was dropped and we did, we did decrease the, stocking rate, um, the sowing rates as well. But, um, but what we ended up finding is that we had really good, um, good growth um, of, of the oats early. It petered out early, um, but the ryegrass came into its own and we were able to maintain that productivity. In fact, actually increase productivity um, throughout the growing season. But again, it peaked in September. When we added more species, so if you um, look, look at adding say a third or a fourth species, so in our case, what we've done is we've um, had a look at adding a, a brassica. 
and also end or a legume. So what we found by adding those extra species, if those species actually all line up, what you can end up getting is each species producing at a different time. So what we, were, what we found in that long growing season was that we had our oats and our brassica produced peaked early in the growing season. Then in the middle of the season, the annual ryegrass um, peaked. But then later in the season, um, in our case, we were working with um, shaft or Persian clover. Um, the Persian actually did the job for us at the end of the growing season. And we ended up with really high production or good production right through till November when things were, things were then flowering. So it means that instead of getting that peak in September, we actually got that peak production in November. So we were able to push it out, which was good. Now, so, but one of the things I guess we noted is that each species, because they're all in a mix, they're all sort of competing with one another. In a good season, it, it wasn't as obvious because we, you know, we have plenty of water. But when you actually, but compared to this year, we've actually noted that there is a lot more competition between our species and it's actually shown in, um, in some of the treatments that we've got. We've also found that we've got quite a significant effect of nitrogen. So different producers do different things in, in how many top dresses they may do. Um, so, um, in, so this year, what we've done is actually had a look at our four-way species mix. So that has got um, oats and brassica. We've got a long season annual ryegrass, and then we've got the Persian clover um, to, to finish the season. And we've gone plus or minus um, nitrogen. Uh, due to the season, we've only got, we only had a single um, application of nitrogen, which was just shy of 50 units of nitrogen. What we found is just that, that small amount of nitrogen or that amount of nitrogen has actually just changed the dynamic within, within that species, in that, um, within that mix. So in a high rainfall year, we found that we had incredible response to the ryegrass, which is probably not surprising. And it actually um, adversely affected the, the, the legume. So the legume just didn't do the job for us. It couldn't get going because the, the ryegrass just used all the nitrogen, took up all the space, used as much water as it could because it was a little bit further along um, on, its, on its growth and it was able to grow faster. This year, We've actually also noted the, the effect of the nitrogen, but it's not as obvious just because things are so dry. But, um, but certainly adding nitrogen, if you've got the legume there, um, wasn't, you know, wasn't, it wasn't very effective. I, I don't, yeah, it wasn't very effective. So um, now one of the things that we were asked about is why drover? Um, and maybe we should be looking at something a bit more like your rabbi. So something a bit more traditional that might be more widely sown around the area. Now we used to always use urabi um, for quite a long time. We were using it here to all these, um, all our fields. Um, we stopped using it because we were starting to get a build up of rust. So we had to change, we changed our variety. So we've got urabi in here um, and it is a slightly shorter season, but it's actually interesting um, and you'll get the opportunity to go through, walk through and have a look at our plots a little bit later on. Um, it does have, um, so urabi does have a shorter um, it's early in maturing, slightly early in maturing, um, but it's but that growth habit was certainly um, was 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 is certainly evident. So the being a um, being a winter type, urabi was actually slower to start. So at our first graze, it was um, it didn't have as much production, but it actually in in say the third and fourth, it was actually more productive than what the drover was. So I guess the reason, so the reason I'm saying, um, I guess we, one of the reasons for having a look at some of um, these different varieties is to, is that it's horses for courses. So you need to be able to, you need to look at your system, see when you want the feed. And, and I guess partly also, uh, um, depending on who you talk to and, and what um, is, is what is actually available for you. But, um, but yeah, to consider your system and how you're going to, to manage it. All right, so um, I guess just to go into some, um, some of the basic, not basic, but um, some of the combined learnings that we've had. Um, from our wet years versus our dry years. Um, 
And I guess that is partly that, um, that it is horses for courses, that you, you need to, if you're looking at mixes or, or even single species, you need to choose something which is actually suitable for your, for your soil, for your climate and for your enterprise when you want feed um, is, is really important. So um, one of the things we noted with, um, with the, the mixed species in the long growing season is because we actually were able to get these, we had, um, we had a different species peaking production, maintaining that high quality throughout the growing season, we we're actually able to maintain quality the nutritive value of that forage, and then that, um, when it was put into grass feed to model poten potential um, um, animal production, we found that intake and also um, the resulting animal production, so live weight gain was actually higher on the mix. But we actually didn't get any difference um, for the first, say, three, three months, four months that we were actually assessing it. it, was only when things started to go reproductive so it comes back to that basic phase two versus phase three. So once things start to go reproductive, you start getting increase in stem and the quality starts to decline. Um, by, by having that mix and having species that actually matured at different times, we were able to maintain that vegetative um, material longer through, in the growing through a long growing season and able to main, maintain quality and therefore animal production as well. Now we're collecting um, samples for forage quality this year um, as well off this experiment. Um, we, the, you know, we're still, the data isn't, um, hasn't been collated yet, um, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens this year when we've actually got a dry. So our intent is to have a look at um, some of the, um, the costs of some of these um, to, to also then sort of get some feedback on, um, be able to provide some feedback on the cost of production you know, the, um, on, on, on also um, mixed versus single species. So when it comes to um, choosing your species, um, consider the paddock that you're growing it in. So if it's got something which is lower lying, um, it's a bit prone to water logging, um, then maybe something like a brassica is not worthwhile. So um, last year we had brassica and our site was a little bit wet and it certainly did not, it did not like it at all. It did not perform, perform very well at all. But, um, but this year and also in, um, in 2021, it actually looked great because our sites were, um, they didn't get waterlogged. Um, weeds. Now weeds are, are something to consider. So prior planning and preparation is always, always good for these. Um, if you've got a high issue of, um, or got particular weeds that might be an issue, then maybe consider them as part of your um, with the species that you're choosing. So if you've got broadleafs you want to control, then, then you know, maybe a legume or, or depending on what the, what, the, uh, what the weeds are, then maybe a brassica is not, not the way to go. Just keep it as, as um, all grasses. Um, legume. Now legumes are, um, again, some people love them, some people don't. It depends on what your goal or your outcome is at the end. The, um, some people, uh, looking at your annual fodder crop to set up for your next pasture. So we've, we've, um, like you were talking about tropical grasses um, with Sean, you know, we, we are advocates for um, having an annual fodder crop. Um, I guess traditionally we, we have always sort of spoke about oats, but, um, but you want to be able to control those, control those weeds. You want to be able, um, so that you've actually got ground cover and um, then you're ready to be able to um, sow your tropical grass pasture into it. Um, so legume with your grazing regime. So um, if you've got if you've got a if you um, set stock, then legumes are probably not what you need to be adding. Or if you've got a quick rotation, so you move your stock around a series of paddocks very quickly, and the legume doesn't get the opportunity to regrow, then it's probably not the um, it's probably best not to include a legume because you just won't see it. They'll just selectively graze it, and it won't get the opportunity to grow. But if you're actually um, in a system where you've got, um, uh, where you have a slightly, where you have a longer rest period, then maybe legumes um, are worth considering, um, especially if you're looking to try and um, build a seed bank for your subsequent pasture, or, um, or if you're going back into a cropping system and you're, you're looking for that, for the opportunity to potentially fix some nitrogen. 
Um, one of the things we've learnt is, um, and, and this, is, this is certainly not, uh, no, no secret, is sowing early is key. So if, we want, if you want that early feed, then you need to sow your fodder crop early. And I guess, um, you know, for, for different reasons, people get caught out at different times. Um, we just noted with, um, with some of the, the fodder crops that, that we've been monitoring, monitoring that um, you know, by, by delaying, by delaying the, uh, the sowing and you know, through whatever reason, whether that be not enough rain or too much rain, um, that delay, you know, a couple of weeks, two weeks, three weeks, um, four weeks delay, um, sort of shifts it beyond ideal, um, can then end up with a couple of months delay when you actually can start grazing. So getting in early is, is key. Now, one of the things that we've um, noted here, because we're actually grazing with a forage harvester, we didn't actually get the opportunity to see any selective grazing. But that's one of the values of actually having a, um, a project like we've got where we're getting out on farm, because um, uh, we noted that, um, that the livestock weren't weren't exactly um, grazing things the way our forage harvester did. And it actually took them a bit to actually get onto the brassicas. So, um, and I don't know, for me, I, it, would, it took a little bit longer than I was anticipating for them to, um, for them to, to decide they did like it and start um, utilising it properly. But that means though, that they were actually then selectively grazing the oats and the rye um, and leaving the brassica um, until a little bit later. Um, nitrogen, if you're going to add nitrogen, um, add it add it early when your pasture is, sorry, when your fodder crop is actually vegetative. Now, if you add it later, then it, what it means though, is that it's just, it's um, the, the fodder crop or depending on the species that, that's going to utilize it, it's actually then going to put it straight into, um, into uh, reproductive mode. So if you want to make the most of it for, for quality production, then um, fertilize it early and and, and then graze it to utilize it. Now, um, probably the last point I really wanna make is that um, in order to get the best out of your fodder crop, if you're going to spend the money on, on sowing it, um, it's really important that we treat it like a crop. Now, we, we say that about our perennial pastures. If you want to get the best out of them, get the best establishment, you need to treat them like a crop. And fodder crops, they're a crop too. We need to treat them similarly. So, you know, while we can just, you know, bung them in and, um, you know, with minimal care and oats is great, it'll just come up and look great and fill a feed gap. The, um, if you actually want to get decent production out of it, then prior planning and preparation. So control your weeds, choose your paddock well, control your weeds and um, choose your species appropriately and fertilise it. And um, store soil moisture because on years like this, that stored soil moisture is what's going to give you um, longer off your, off your um, fodder crop. So our commercial properties um, that we're following, they've already taken their weaners off their fodder crops um, because um, things have just, just turned really dry for them um, and they've had to change strategy. So um, yeah, so I guess my final point is, is to um, treat it like a crop, feed it like a crop. Um, yeah, and, um, and then it can deliver the goods for you. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, um, look, selective grazing is something that we probably, um, yeah, it's, it's, well, that's one of the great things about going out on farm is that you actually get a better understanding of that selective grazing. And, and I think they are a bit of a quiet taste, um, but um, a bit bitter. And I, and I don't know whether it's quite a case of there's nothing else to eat, so I'll start on them. But, um, but yes, they are a bit of an acquired taste. I don't like Brussels sprouts, but um, my mother-in-law likes to feed them to me, thinking, thinking that maybe my preferential grazing will improve. So, um, yeah, so I don't know. It's, maybe it's a bit of an acquired taste. I've, I've touched on this a few before, and you've put the sheep in, say, to this paddock here. And you'll get, you know, say, say you put 100 sheep in this paddock here, and 50 of them will put their head down immediately and start eating you get five or six more that are 10 metres away before they put their head down. And then it's further and further. And you look up after about five seconds and there's a couple of sheep 50 metres away. And they haven't struck a blow yet. Sheep and cattle, horses, any of those animals, they all smell what they're going to eat first. If they don't like the smell of it, they'll find, they'll keep going until they find something that smells good and that's their trigger to eat it. 
that's something to keep in the back of your mind as well. Um, yes, we do the same thing. Humans do the same thing. You like your cake before your Brussels sprouts too? Oh, yeah. Brent? Yeah, ice cream. You know, I'll leave um, asparagus and Brussels sprouts to the end. Yeah, fair call. Um, so you have to keep that in mind when you're, when you're even sowing mixes as well. Yeah. Yeah, um, look, there are a range of different species that do have different, that are quite distinctive um, in, their, in their taste and their, and their smell, um, which certainly can affect um, livestock uh, grazing or their preferential, what they're preferential yeah. grazing. Thank you for your presentation. It was great. Um, just a comment regarding with cattle, we can even graze in a multi-species um, by increasing the, select, the grazing pressure or, or we decrease the selection. So if you put a lot of pressure with cattle, a lot of cattle in a small area, with a bit of training at, in a few days or even in a, in a couple of weeks, they won't even look at what they are grazing. They're just gonna go for it. But yeah, it takes a bit of labor and training uh, for the cattle. But that's a practice that we see a lot of people that do a lot of multi-species usually goes together with increasing grazing pressure as well. Yeah, um, so among our producers, um, the, the validation sites that we've got, um, we've got uh, two, two different grazing regimes there. We have one which is um, cycling through, so high stock numbers, as you're talking about, um, moving very quickly through. Um, so I think it was like five days, five days on and, um, and up to maximum 20 days regrowth, something like that. Well, we've got others which, which have a longer regrowth period between. Yeah, my question for these plots are, so um, regarding the first time you cut it, uh, what are you basing, basing your decision on? So basing on the oats, which is the predominant crop, or basing on the legumes? Because I, I, I guess the first cut is very important because you are, they, they don't grow all at the same rate. So if you base your decision on the oats, you are not favoring the other um, species, which is understandable because there's a multi-species, nothing to do about it. But just, I was wondering, what are you basing your decision at the moment of grazing? So our initial grazing was um, was based on basically the brassica. So we knew we knew we couldn't graze it until it was eight weeks, um, and then from there, so eight weeks was our trigger to start. And because we wanted to try and um, you know simulate maximum maximum um, grazing, we um, we do our assessments every month, so yeah, every four weeks.